Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. We'll just give it one minute to allow everyone to join and then we'll get started. Hi everyone, for those who have just joined us, um, we'll give it one minute and then we'll get started with today's webinar. Amazing. So thank you again for joining us for our second GMF webinar. We really love having you all here. Um, I'm on the call. My name is Bethany and I'm the marketing comms manager here at Big Give. And joining me is Karen from the Big Give team. <laughs> and then, of course, Ed from Shape History. But I'll let him introduce himself in a minute. Um, and just before we get started, I'll do a little bit of admin. So everyone should see a chat box um, at the bottom of their Zoom panel. If you set that to everyone, you can introduce yourselves, use it to share your ideas and thoughts or any issues that you have there. There is also a Q&A box at the bottom of your um, Zoom screen. So you can use that to type in any of your questions. We'll address them throughout the session and at the end. Um, if for accessibility reasons you need to have captions, there is a show captions button at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a live transcript of the webinar today. And just for your information, this webinar is being recorded and we'll have it available to watch on YouTube after the session as well. And of course, if there's um, any reason you can't get to your questions or you find you have additional questions, please do send us an email and we're happy to um, answer those for you. But yeah, without further ado, I'll pass straight on to Ed. Awesome. Thanks, Beth. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, giving me your time today. Um, I'm Ed Fletcher. I'm one of the managing directors of Shape History. So we're a social impact communications agency that are uh, working with Big Give um, for this year's Green Match Fund. We work for about six months. Um, but more broadly, we work with social impact organizations all over the world, um, including on, uh, on fundraising strategy and campaigns. My background prior to Shape History is also in fundraising. So Hopefully I can bring some of that, that knowledge um, from, previous, from a previous life into today. So in terms of today's webinar, what we're hoping to cover is a bit of an overview of some of the key considerations around fundraising campaigns more broadly at, at this moment in time. We'll dive into the specific creative direction that um, hopefully some of you will have seen in some surveys we did a little bit earlier um, last month. Uh, and, and talk you through the final direction and, and give you a few tips and tricks for how you can utilize that, utilize it. And I guess ultimately um, from today, what, I'd, what we'd love to kind of get, get through is um, ideas, strategies, um, tactics to obviously ultimately increase donations and um, to hit your appeal targets and really amplify campaigns to your existing and, and future potential donors. So um, yeah, as Karen said, feel free to drop questions and comments in there. Oh, I've got one of my old, my old colleagues, Vicky Wallace on the call. Um, cool. So as I mentioned, before we kind of dive into the creative direction, we thought it'd be useful just to think about some of the big considerations for, for you guys for this year's campaign or appeal. So first and, and foremost- Just to cut in, so do you want to do the poll? Oh uh, yeah, actually good. good. Um, Karen, uh, sorry, Beth and Karen just set up a quick poll, untitled poll, just um, for anyone who, just to find out kind of who was here yesterday, uh, who's new today. So if you will take a second just to fill that out. Um, Beth, how long do you want to leave that one for? Are we getting votes in? Right. I can't actually see the staring screen. Yeah, I will close it now and you can hopefully see that. Okay, so most of you, um, this is your first webinar. For some of you, um, so about, yeah, just about a third of you, you were here yesterday. 
So um, bear with us on the first couple of sections because we're going to just do a bit of a review of some of the key um, considerations of trade direction, and then we'll dive into some slightly more kind of um, further thinking around specific tactics and ideas around this year's appeal. So for those of you who weren't here uh, yesterday, um, just run through some key considerations. Obviously, the cost of living um, is, is probably a massive consideration. I'm sure you're all, all having conversations about in terms of thinking how to frame fundraising asks. Uh, we're talking to a lot of our partners at the moment about whether to lean into this, whether to avoid it as a topic of conversation. Um, our general kind of recommendations are, I think it's, it's almost impossible to ignore that uh, this is a big kind of factor for, for people considering donating to you at well, any time for, throughout the year, but particularly around the appeal. So you will know your audiences better than anybody, but I think our general kind of agency recommendation is not to ignore it. I think that comes across as a bit tone deaf. Definitely to think about how you can bring it in in a sensitive way, um, but also going to highlight, I guess, is an opportunity to highlight the, that even people who feel that they can only give can give less or really can, are wondering whether they can, they can give at all, the match funding, the doubling the donation can be a really powerful motivator to, to get people to still donate, even if it's a little bit less, but still being able to double that impact. So I, that's kind of our first key consideration. Making an impact locally. Now, I know for, for those of you who work internationally this is this is going to be particularly challenging um, as opposed to those of you who work in, in, in a more kind of UK for UK, UK focus but I think even thinking about how you can localize um part of your appeal with your team your kind of local community where your where your headquarters are based thinking about how you can bring the global versus local conversation um I think is going to be really important particularly for for older generations, for older givers. And again, this isn't um these aren't this isn't kind of universe universal university kind of coverage, but I think on a general level, I think it's really important to think both at a global level, but also if you can bring it down to local, either in terms of the focus of your appeal or in terms of your your project team, your headquarters, where they're based, your community links. And then lastly, like nature is more is <laughs> nature is more natural. This is one of our, one of um, my strategy directors Lewis's points. Obviously, when people think about that, uh, for those of you kind of particularly in the kind of climate and green tech space, that can seem removed uh, too removed to, to some audiences even even now. Obviously, for you, for those of you who are talking to warm audiences, that might be slightly different. But one of the framings that we've kind of been able to to introduce with a few partners. Who either are more kind of uh, at a more sort of strategic policy level is, is kind of connecting climate with nature and thinking about how you can bring that framing into your messaging to help audiences more readily identify with the work that you're doing. So those are few, just a few kind of key considerations to to kick things off. What I should say is that at the end of each the sec of the end of each section that we'll just take a pause just to answer any any questions that you've got. So feel free to start putting questions in the Q and A box. Uh, and we'll come to those at the end of each section. Um, it's very rare that I go through a uh, presentation deck without some either Star Wars or, or Lord of the Rings reference, and here's mine. Um, don't forget to take audiences on a journey, obviously not to Mount Doom. I think the key thing to think about here is with appeals, it's very easy to go straight in for the ask. And whilst, I rec whilst we obviously recognise that the appeal, the appeal week is only a week long, really think about what that kind of emotional journey is that you can take your audiences on and that may even start before the appeal period i think it's really important that you almost warm up audiences ahead of the ahead of the appeal so you're not going straight in with asks but rather you're build taking on a bit of a bit of a journey um and obviously that journey does that shouldn't and does doesn't and shouldn't end at the end of the appeal week um think about what your post your post appeal journey is as well because Obviously, fundamentally, I guess your your number one objectives, and this was a, this is a question yesterday, is around hitting your um, appeal target. But it's also this is also an amazing engagement of opportunity for you to build kind of build wider, more prospective audiences and bring them in through the doubling um, the, the match funding opportunity that, that you may have not had before. So really think about what happens next. What's the what's the stewardship uh, journey that goes beyond the appeal journey that goes beyond the appeal week. Now, one way to frame that and think about that journey, which we apply to almost all of our communications, is around emote educate action. 
75% or sorry, 95% of decision making uh, happens on a subconscious emotional level before we've even really had a chance to rationalize and process um, our, 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 our messaging, our, our, our journey, the, the decisions we're trying to make. So really think about within your, your appeal messaging, what's that emotive hook that you can really kind of lock people into, whether that's human interest, and that may be human interest and benef from end, benef end users and beneficiaries, it may be human interest from the people on the ground that are working, um, that are working, that are working towards uh, the project that your appeal is supporting. Some UK AIDS tracker work uh, yeah, a few years ago now, show, uh, one of the key insights was that closing the gap or creating more more connections between donors and people delivering work um, can be really effective at, at, at build, building relevance and building connection. So really think about what that initial emotive proposition is for your audiences before you start to dive into um, more informational, more educational content. And obviously when you're doing that and that second, that second part of educating people, really think about what information do people need in order to take them to the next step, which is which is ultimately donating. There can be a tendency to overload people with information. And that's not to say that's not important. And particularly if you've got kind of quite complex projects or um, you've got projects that are happening over a long period of time or that you've got really interesting impact data um, from previous similar projects that can act as really useful proof of concept. Just think about what are the biggest, what would be the biggest drivers and motivators for your audience? Having wider content and wider information is always great, but really think about whether you need that in your kind of primary audience journey. And obviously kind of thinking about that last piece around action, thinking about signposting people to, to clear actions and, and also giving people actions beyond an initial donation. Um, how can you take a, a one-off donor into becoming an advocate, an ambassador, a spokesperson to to talk about talk about your appeal within that within that appeal week because peer to peer peer to peer communications, um, as I'm sure many of you will be aware, can be an incredibly powerful tool when it's not necessarily coming from you as a brand, but it's coming from people independent of you who you, might be your supporters who who can be who can be that that mouthpiece that platform to to widen widen the net and engage their networks. Just a bit about kind of appeal messaging. Obviously, thinking about that umbrella statement, that umbrella, umbrella proposition around the appeal, and we always try to we always think in, in in rules of three. So, what are the three core things that you want people to take away from your appeal that you think are going to to motivate people to to interest people to engage people? Now, those core messages may be tailored towards different audiences. But really try to synthesize down what are the three key things that you think is going to be, are going to be the most persuasive arguments for getting for, for getting potential donors onto the next stage of um, of donating. And underneath those, think about have you got stories, have you got evidence and proof points that back up what you're saying above, um, what those core messages are, are, are leaning into, so that you've not you're not just You've not just you're not just saying words. You're not just kind of putting put, putting kind of big statements out there. You've actually got proof and impact and evidence to back that up. Quite often, we see on on fundraising journeys, people get engaged initially. They're emotion, emotionally hooked, and they see kind of information and, and and information that is really relevant to them. But that proof of concept piece can be, and that that final nudge to get someone to donate is, can we get kind of a big drop off, particularly in kind of an early majority, late majority, late majority space? So really think about how you can apply that framework to your appeal messaging and really consolidate it as much as possible. Particularly if you're really thinking about a social first journey. Obviously, like we, there's there's lots of data out there and lots of kind of reports that saying that 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 you the digital behaviour of of audiences. It's become and, and uh, attention spans are becoming shorter and shorter. So the more that you can consolidate your messaging, uh, the more likely you have got, you, the more likely you, you've got a chance of taking your donors on a journey that ultimately leads in 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 a donation to the appeal. So that's just some sort of top level communications um, framing considerations. Uh, did anyone have any questions about any of those? Nope. Cool. Okay. No worries. Well, we'll move on. Um, if anything comes to mind, then feel free to feel free to to jump in later.
So, um, introducing the Green Match Fund Creative for this year. Um, now, Big Give have put um, a lot of effort and time into building out um, the Green Match Fund identity for this year. Um, and we actually kind of, as, as I mentioned earlier, some of you will have taken part in a, in a survey a few weeks ago where we presented a number of different directions. And the one we've gone for um, is the most pop was the most popular, which is double double. So we double your we double your donations and double your impact. Now the reason that we have gone with this direction, one is because some of the feedback we got is that match funding as a term isn't universally understood by UK donors. Um, it can come across as a bit technical. So we went, we've kind of we're really leaning into this idea of like double your donation, double your impact, because that kind of does what it says on the tin. Um, anyone can understand that, and it also kind of opens up lots of space for for creative for creative ideas for both um, visual content and also messaging. Um, also, one of the key points that we kind of went, having done an audit of last year's Green Match Fund, we noticed that there was quite a lot of uh, variety in terms of how uh, Green Match Fund content um, and branding was being applied. Now. Although the Christmas challenge is obviously a, a, a hugely, a much kind of much more widely known, has kind of a longer history. The Green Match Fund is still kind of in its relative infancy, um, and so, and also, whilst Big Give as a as a brand and as an entity will be well known to to all the charities on this call, I'm sure, it, there's not necessarily so much kind of public understanding or appreciation or recognition of the brand. So the more that your communications can feel in line and and cohesive as and unifying um, with both Big Give and all the charity partners uh, that 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 are taking part. Obviously, bringing in your own specific kind of brand nuance. The more credibility, the more trust, the more equity we can build in the Green Match Fund, um, which moving through to future years is going to make is is only going to make people more likely to uh, to engage, to be interested, to want to donate because they they recognise the Big Give brand. Um, in a, in a much in a much greater way. So, just kind of moving, we're going to talk. I'm just going to talk through a few kind of um, particular aspects of of this direction. So, overarching um, the overarching kind of elevator pitch, which we really kind of recommend that everyone everyone considers building into their appeal messaging. We I've already mentioned it. The Green Match Fund doubles your donation, doubles your impact. And I think those two things, those two kind of statements, doubles your donation, doubles your impact appeal to slightly different motivators um, uh, within audiences. So on the one hand, you've got those who want to give to want to maximize, ma want to maximize kind of the, the disposable income they have. And so that double your donation um, is that kind of is that feel good kind of almost commercial commercially minded um, motivator of, of maximizing maximizing their, your, their donation. And then also that doubling of the impact. So those who are Kind of more altruistically minded who are kind of more focused on the impact the ability to double that impact the two aren't necessarily um isolated and, and do intersect to some degree but they slightly appeal to different aspects of, of an audience persona now we've also got in this for a week of green giving and we kind of put out and put out kind of initial um initial feelers for um the idea of thinking about this week as a week of green giving um it's it's not as a it's not something we're going to be pushing this year but certainly um in the years to come we're definitely thinking about how we can bring this in more prominently because again green give a green giving week or giving more broadly is a much more re well recognized term um for philanthropy for kind of public philanthropy than the nesso match funding is so it may be worth thinking about how you can build that in and again, that may, may open up other opportunities for you to engage different parts of your community, of your, of your supporters, who may not necessarily be in a position to give financially, but, but are able to give in other ways. And by kind of opening up, and I'll talk a bit about, a bit about different touch points later, by opening up kind of the ways in which people can get involved, you're gonna broaden and widen the net of people that, that are gonna see your appeal. So just think about that as a as a kind of a secondary message, but also an additional opportunity to build the profile of your appeal to give people different touch points and different different ways to get involved. So just going a bit more into um, into kind of some key messaging, I'll just read this through. 
So did you say double double? That's right. Big give or double double your donation to the charity of your charity of your choice. Um, you give, we pay. Double donation, double impact. Double down, double double, double like cheeseburger, double like double decker, double like chocolate chip, double 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 double. Um, all right, we think you get it. Green giving just got greener. Um, it's double this week only. So from a big give standpoint, we're going to use a slightly more colloquial, slightly much more personal um, and even humorous tone just to disrupt the feed, um, the feed of kind of people, of people, what people are expecting to see by typical charity campaigns uh, and, and particularly match funding appeals. So we want this to be noisy. We want it to be a little bit clickbaited. We also want to build in that urgency and that momentum. I think one of the biggest strengths of this appeal is going to be that actually the, the, sh the, the shortness of that of the appeal period, which gives you immediate urgency to draw on. Now, obviously, you've got your own brand tone of voice to consider, but it's always worth thinking, how can you bring in some of this messaging and maybe take a slightly different tone um, to what you would usually do just to kind of disrupt people's feed to make them think, hang on a second, this isn't something I see kind of day and this isn't evergreen content, this is something different. Obviously, we're also drawing on the new branding of Big Give to to kind of to, to, to amplify that. So just have a think about how you might want to bring in this. And again, this doubling, this, this doubling message, both um, verbally and visually, you can there's a lot of space to play here. And I think we really encourage you, yes, to have obviously that flagship content that speaks directly to your appeal. But also, if you can think about supplementing that content with some with um some slightly more off the wheels, slightly more disruptive, disruptive um, visual content that just draws people in, and 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 I, I'm going to use this term quite a few times. Double down on this message. Um, the more that we can build this sense of, uh, of 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 excitement, of interest, of momentum, the more eyeballs you're going to get on your appeal. And they may not be the typical eyeballs that that would usually be there, um, but I think that creates new opportunities for you, you, you as charities. And and ultimately, I think particularly in the climate green space, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of negative messaging that that goes out that um, that maybe kind of can create uh, giving fatigue, that can create that sense of the overwhelming odds that that, that you as charities are, uh, are looking to overcome, and that can that can trickle down into your into your kind of supporter base. So trying to mix that up with some slightly more personal colloquial content um, that just kind of gives you kind of more a kind of a wider variety and a wider kind of opportunity to to post content throughout the appeal period and even before, um, just kind of gives you that that space to think about that. So. Here are just a few examples of some of the content um, and sample posts that uh, the Big Giver put together as, as um, that will also be in the toolkit, which we'll touch on. So just thinking about how, you, again, you can think about using humor, you can think about using double imagery, um, which works across animal-focused charities, it works across conservation, it can also work across sort of um, more uh, sophisticated like policy uh, or kind of complex policy policy charities with that with that wider focus so just think about how yes bring in the the double your donation um double your donation messaging but also have a bit of fun with with image with with imagery with um with typography in terms of the toolkit which i believe is going to be uh circulated tomorrow we've created a variety of um uh, frames and kind of and transparent uh, transparent uh, content that can be then you can then use to sort of uh, put on top of your your own your own imagery. We've got some more finalized countdown content um, that can just again be used just to keep the message going, to keep the the conversation going, and then some fully designed up examples. Uh, for specific types of um, specific types of audiences. Again, these will feel free to kind of work with as work with the content as much as you want. But we'd really recommend at, at a bare minimum to to make sure that all your content has the Green Match Fund Big Give um, logos on it. Um, but definitely, if you can lean into some of the creative, then then we really recommend it just to create that unity, that cohesion, and build that build the credibility in the Green Match Fund. In terms of um, hashtags, obviously, like use the hash use the Green Match Fund hashtag as much as you can, just to, again tie it back to to the to the overarching kind of campaign, I guess, of, of this year's Green Match Fund. 
and really think about tagging in big give uh, again from a credibility standpoint it comes back to this point of the more that we can raise the raise raise your audience's base understanding of big give and maybe particularly think about this as some messaging and some content ideas for like pre-appeal you can warm them up to the idea of who big give are how they work how they match funds so that by the time you get to the appeal week that that explain that ex explanation is already out there and you've kind of you've already gone through that educational process with your audiences and we can really start to think about taking them on the next stage of the journey um Ah, so there are a couple of questions here. Um, so there's one about uh, where does the toolkit live? Beth, do you want to turn it on? Yeah, sure. So as Ed mentioned, we'll circulate the toolkit tomorrow, hopefully, um, and we'll obviously email you all of your charities to let you know. Um, but it'll also live in the resources section of the portal. So if you log into the portal and you go to the support section, you'll find the resources there and the toolkit will be included in that. Awesome. Cool. Thanks. Um, there was another question um, around collaboration between evidence and proof points. So <clears throat> there are a couple of ways to think about this. And again, like this is just our interpretation, but, um, but everyone will have their kind of slight nuance. Evidence is slightly more is slightly more kind of weighty arguments that might be around sort of impact data and and and, and, and impact data previous project previous projects proof points you can it's almost sort of extracting from that the kind of the, the the most kind of key and salient points but also thinking more in the proof points space around um, testimonials so maybe kind of slightly more kind of human led um, and tend to be kind of just shorter bite sized pieces whereas evidence you may it may be looking at a similar project that that you've run where there's kind of evidence to support your hypothesis particularly if um if it's moving into a, into a new space proof points are slightly more kind of shorter form pieces of content that again might be indirect someone um some someone kind of commenting on on someone to commenting on your projects having kind of speakers or sorry having ambassadors or or key key figures who can endorse the evidence to um to to a large extent so and actually, also proof points can come into um, can then come into sort of supporters and fundraisers themselves. So um, a really useful a really useful proof point um, if you've got it, if you get any kind of qualitative feedback from uh, from supporters uh, having donate having donated, and you kind of get that through as your channels or just through the kind of conversations. Even thinking about capturing some of those um, those quotes as proof, so, which is actually a proof point of the audience rather than the project. So evidence is, that is kind of more project, more more project based. Proof points can both be project based, but can also be proof points uh, that represent social proof of of your of your of your of the types of your audiences already engaging with the project, already engaging with the the appeal. Um, so hopefully that's going to answer that question. Cool. So um, that's the creative direction, I guess. Yes. Yeah, so before we move on, were there any other any other questions on the creative on the creative direction for this year, the double double direction? No. Cool. Move on. So in terms of maximizing uh, the the double double direction, and just thinking about some broader kind of tips and tricks for this year. I'm sure all of you are already thinking about this, and I kind of mentioned it earlier, but this obviously this. Uh, match funding can be a brilliant way to open up new conversations and access new uh, new donors in a way that your evergreen content might not, might not necessarily be able to in the same way. So really think about who your warm audiences are, who your colder audiences are, and what the different propositions need to be for those audiences and how you can build those in. And also thinking about which, which of all of the channels that you have available to you uh are going to lean more towards one or, or the other of those audiences because they're just slightly different journeys um still following that emote educate action approach but just thinking about kind of tailoring that content to be slightly more to be slightly more tailored to, to one or or, or or the other of those audiences equally it might be the case you think there's a fairly even split so organic socials are always kind of a, a big space where you where there's the potential to get both both kind of warm audiences potential cold ones in fact actually paid social media is probably where you're going to get you're going to be able to reach more cold audiences so just think about your slightly different proposition on say a um a facebook ad 
that's targeting an audience that you don't necessarily always engage with as opposed to um as opposed to piece you're putting out to your newsletters to your regular supporters it's also worth if you if it, if it, and you and again a lot of you may already be doing this um or not have already already do have this thinking about the behaviors of your audiences and thinking about segmenting them by behaviors so this is an example of uh, an outdoors pursuit slightly older persona that we've worked we've been working with with big give who um and and with some of the key things we tend to think about are kind of motivations which really start to think about what the emotional proposition uh, might kind of be framed around what specific characteristics they have because this is great for for targeting um particularly for pay for paid media and then some of the barriers is where you can start to bring in some of the proof points so it's the, from an from an emotional standpoint finding the positive motivators initially is usually enough to get people kind of interested. Use it what that where they will typically where the journey will typically kind of fall down and, and end for a for an, for an audience it will be around kind of one of their core barriers that stops them from taking that final step. So really thinking about your proof points, which will come later in the in the in the kind of in the communications journey. Thinking about how can your proof points address one or or, or kind of one of the one of the key or or multiple barriers um that's a lot obviously to fit in and i think it's one of the key things we then think about is how can you find what are the core drivers the the core barriers and and the commonalities across across that audience so for us for this persona for instance it's future for family community centric and, and commercial multiplier particularly on the basis that this is that audience is going to tend to be sort of an abc1 um demographic with possibly a second home near a coastal region so that's the made that's made us start to think well maybe kind of more kind of ocean coastal uh chat um causes or imagery that you know you wouldn't necessarily kind of select if they if they're based in 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 the green belt but because of that second home affiliation they may be more open to that type of imagery um future for family i think particularly for older for older generations linking through to um securing the future for for their grandchildren that becomes particularly prevalent, particularly when you start to get the old, the older part of that age age bracket, and also we kind of we have identified this this audience as a more kind of like almost Britain first or kind of uh, internally facing audience, which is quite a challenging one. So bringing in that community, that local um, that local impact piece can be really, could, could be really useful, and even again localizing that to your to your team, not necessarily to to the, to the work that the appeal that will be supporting. So hopefully that can just give you a bit of a, a glance of, of key audience personas and really thinking not just at a social demographic level, but thinking at a behavioral level um, and not necessarily limiting those those behavioral segments, those behavioral personas too much by age, because it's quite possible that so, but that a lot of that behavioral profile can actually be attributed to, to people of multiple age groups. I talked a little bit about, about touch points and just wanted to touch on the touch on a little bit more. So for a lot of charities that um, are doing fundraising, fundraising campaigns at the moment, there's a very big kind of lean towards digital and, and social media. And absolutely, that's definitely a, a space to, to operate in. But one of the, but oh, there are so many more as well, particularly like press. And I'll talk a bit more about press later. I've got national local there. I think just be wary of putting too many resources into national press unless you've got a story that's really worthy of, 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 of national media attention. And I know that for most of you, if not all of you, um, you will feel that 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 your the issue that your the your appeal is supporting and your charity more widely deserves more national attention. But just kind of measure that with a bit of realism in terms of what are the key, what are the key talking points in, in the media at the moment. Are there opportunity, genuine opportunities to to frame some of your some of your, some of your appeal, the focus of the appeal with that? If not, really think about how you can access and 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 localize localize kind of press opportunities again. Whether it's thinking about where your head offices are, or where your team where your team are located, or where you might have partnerships that you can start to build a more local lo, a local angle. Radio can also be really useful for that in terms of accessing more local audiences. Um, a lot of you, I'm sure, a lot of your, your of your charities of you of, of your supporters will already um, be fund be regular fundraisers who may not necessarily 
give on a, on a kind of a, an individual, a one-off or regular basis, but they do fundraising events for you. And this was always something that, um, that we used to really think about um, in my fundraising days was how can we mobilize fundraisers to become uh, advocates, ambassadors of appeals. So asking them not to donate, but actually asking them to be kind of a core, a, a core mouthpiece and ambassador for, for the appeal, giving them the, the tools, the messaging, the content to be able to go out to their networks and actually access the network, their networks um, with this appeal. Um, blogs is an interesting one and something just to be wary of because obviously you want to kind of streamline that journey as much as possible to your donate to your donate page on on big give site but i think it's always useful to have that kind of wider more in, more educational content um somewhere so that if people do need more than just uh your kind of core and, and secondary messaging there is a space they can go further now obviously to some extent you'll have that on your on your kind of donate page but it's always useful to think about that kind of that other space that 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 where people can delve a bit, a bit deeper for those that need more convincing and need more evidence um obviously this is also a great opportunity to think about engaging community fundraising um schools workplaces community centers match funding campaigns and appeals can be great opportunities to start those conversations for some, for some of you, hopefully you've already started that because obviously we've only got a few weeks until the appeal going live now. But if you haven't, it's still worth sending out um, and just contacting places that have supported you in the past or that you're kind of having ongoing, going, ongoing conversations with just to utilize the Green Match Fund as a great way to mobilize that support and take them along that final next step. Um, obviously your mailing list goes without saying, like definitely plan your email journey, definitely think about warming that audience up before the appeal week. Um, and, and that even may start, that, that even could start as early as this week, just to announce the Green Match Fund is coming and tell them a bit more about Big Give and how the match, and how the match funding works. Um, <clears throat> talking of sort of ambassadors, advocates, obviously some of you will have trustees that are super involved. Others, others of you will have trustees who are public figures, um, celebrity endorsements or influences that you're connected with. with. Really think about, if not asking them to to support directly, think about how you can work and work with them to amplify the campaign to their networks. And think again, thinking about who are who are in those networks. Are they your typical audience audience personas, or are they slightly different? And just thinking about framing your proposition slightly differently. If you've got a young, a youth influencer versus a uh, kind of a, a, a readily involved trustee who um, who has a big commercial history. Um, then maybe think about the slightly kind of framing that proposition to those different audiences and giving people as much content as as you can up front, giving them the space to make it personal, but making sure they stay on message. Um, and actually the last one that I had to mention, and this is kind of more of a trend we're seeing, and this was what one charity particularly yesterday mentioned they were doing, is think about events, yes, offline. Um, any fundraiser I'm sure will, 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 will be aware and know that a face-to-face -face ask can be infinitely more effective so it gives you that opportunity to really have a conversation but also thinking about um hosting kind of virtual a virtual webinar a, a, a virtual panel discussion about your topic um probably in the middle of the appeal so people are already aware of it and this is kind of a a, a, ne a next touch point for someone who hasn't yet donated but is kind of interested to hear more we're seeing um, a lot at the moment from a trend perspective, these kind of video podcasts or live, live film webinars that give you as a charity the opportunity to, opportunity to del delve and dive, in, dive into your cause, your appeal in a much, kind of in a much deeper and, and more meaningful way. And again, for some audiences, that's going to be really important to feel to feel that connection, but also to 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 to, to hear that hear that kind of that di that di that deeper theory of change, that deeper impact you're trying to create. So, um, I'd really recommend it as an as an as a, a slightly kind of off the wall touch point um, during the appeal to raise the profile and think about whether you whether you have time or you have people you're already connected with from different spaces who can who you can bring into that panel and then utilize their profile to then amplify the campaign out to their networks so hopefully that's i'm sure a lot of you will already be thinking about most of these or all of these already but i just wanted to run through them just to just as, as a as a reminder
from a paid marketing perspective, um, we talked about this from an organic perspective, an organic, organic standpoint yesterday, but from a paid strategy, we're very much, we very much suggest focusing primarily on meta, so Facebook and Instagram. Twitter can be great for initial engagement and awareness, but 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 from and again, this might be slightly different to your charities, but across our partners, we generally generally see that Twitter can be useful for engage for engage for awareness and engagement, but not necessarily for translating through to donations. Um, LinkedIn's a funny one because although it is still very much the professional the professional platform, that's slowly starting to shift. Where I'd just be wary is that LinkedIn, LinkedIn fundraising, LinkedIn, sorry, LinkedIn um, advertising at the moment is is far more expensive than than the other platforms. And actually, I got um, our performance marketing director to pull this off this morning that shows that Facebook um, and actually kind of this is yeah, particularly Facebook uh, advertising. So cost cost per million impressions um, at the moment is 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 almost as low as it has been in the last three or so years. So that won't last forever. Definitely think about bringing that into bringing that into your targeting strategy for paid media. And I'd also really recommend just thinking about building that audience or starting that 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 marketing journey possibly a week before. Um, maybe not putting maybe obviously kind of thinking about your budget distribution across pre pre and during, and and waiting more towards during, but just getting kind of getting the algorithms working and getting kind of starting to get your more kind of emotive content to get people interested can be a really effective way um, just to start, just to make your kind of money go a little bit further on, on, on paid marketing. So a few other kind of pieces. One, if you've already got pixel tracking um, on your website, think about how you can utilize that data to, to support targeting. Um, secondly, thinking about splitting budget across different different audience personas and thinking about how they map on digitally if you've got an audience that you're really confident in um ob obviously it goes out saying kind of like gear your budget towards that audience but as i've said this match funding can create new opportunities to engage a slightly different type of audience so just think about potentially trialing some budget towards a an audience you've been considering because it's it's unlikely that you'll have a better opportunity to to see if there's traction there. And lastly, really think about your your paid funnel journey. So thinking about what that initial emotive content is um, to grab people's attention, uh, and and that can be again if that's video content, great. We'll talk a bit about video in a second. Ideally, that video content will then direct people direct people through to the big give land big your big give landing page, and they'll go straight to donate. But if they don't, if they don't kind of go, if they don't go, if they don't um, click the button to learn more or or donate or whatever it might be, think about then what's your retargeting content. This when you can start to bring that short form, more kind of educational content that ultimately again takes takes people through to landing pages to donate. And lastly, like from a retention perspective, always like kind of really try to think about what's your com what does your comms journey look like for an audience beyond uh, beyond donation. And there's just a little point here around kind of thinking about kind of your your e depending on your data privacy policy, thinking on how you can use your email database to build look like audiences. Um, hopefully, those of you with who have got digital marketing teams will will, will know will know what we're talking about there. But um, essentially, using email addresses that have got social profiles linked to those can help to build profiles of uh, audience audience targeting of similar similar types of, of, of profiles online. So just for some content trend perspective, and I'll try to keep this last quick so I can see quite a few questions coming in. So um, this <laughs> slightly contradicts what I said earlier, but really thinking about what can audiences learn with kind of short form video. So we're seeing more and more kind of educational kind of short form video that between 10 to 30 seconds is is, is becoming more and more um is, is performing better and better so i think still framing it um with an emo with an emo with an with emotionally engaged an emotion emotive driver initially but having kind of that short via three things to know about this appeal can be really effect has, is, is showing to be really effective um content and this can be put together really simply, um, or using kind of, or like using kind of, if you're on, if you're on a short turnaround, using agencies you're already working with, or even Fiverr can be a great um, can be a great one for just putting this really short form video content together. If you haven't got video content from your appeals and projects, like stock can actually still work pretty well here. Um, get real, get personal. So um, 
we're also seeing this kind of real trend, and I think I'm sure lots of you have seen it, in terms of if you don't have um, video editing in-house or you're not working with agencies, even having um, personal messages from key members of staff, um, either, either kind of on the ground overseas or kind of even in your head office, um, with personal messages can be really powerful. So just, and, and again, also try to always think in portrait mode. Um, portrait does tend to work across platform now as a more effective, um, more effective video format. Um, and lastly, uh, TikTok and IG Reels. Uh, the, the interesting thing, or particularly on TikTok, but also um, and also to an extent on Reels, is they're becoming more of a story. They're becoming more story based platforms. So TikTok is traditionally is traditionally linked with kind of short form, um, like 15, 10 to twenty second content. Um, this is an example that was uh, put on our uh, was put on our, our inspiration Slack channel this uh, yesterday morning, which was um, a Jewish death charity that actually did a three minute um, TikTok video. Some of you may have seen it. That's since gone viral and has got over eight hundred thousand um, uh, likes, which is more than the followers vastly outgoes the number of followers they've got. Um, and it was just a tick. It was actually a TikTok kind of three minute video of the of uh some uh, uh, deaf firefighters taking um a jewish deaf charity kind of audience through safety precautions and it went viral so really think about um reels to to continue that journey both personal and also an organizational level uh, and think about the different ways in which you can utilize these platforms like tiktok to 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 produce that more kind of informational but at the same time emotive content um, and again, that might be looking at uh, doing doing some content with some of your supporters where you're kind of talking to them about the appeal and, and getting that interaction. Um, but there are loads of opportunities to, to, to diversify the types of content you're putting out there. Um, lastly, just to quickly talk about step, um, press tips. I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of this, but a fundraising campaign generally isn't a story. You've really got to think about within your appeal, what is, what is, the, what is the interesting... What's the interesting angle for a journalist? Um, as I mentioned, don't waste resources on, on nationals unless you have a story worthy. Um, it can be a bit, bit of a red herring. If you've got great press links, great, but um, really try to think about what's new, what's different, um, what's the new kind of thought leadership you're putting out as part of this appeal. And, and obviously look, try, to, try to think about how you can localize your story if possible. Again, I appreciate that isn't gonna be possible for everybody, but, um, but just try to think a little bit creatively. And then there are a few more press tips in here around like really thinking about cultivate relationships, do your research, who's writing about, about your specific issues. Don't just put it out to general editors. Um, freelancers actually, freelance journalists are often the best people to cultivate because they're always looking for stories rather than staffers who'll turn up and just look for updates. Um, the longer lead time you can give them, the better. So if you're able to start reaching out now, just to say this is coming up, I think that you'll find this really interesting. Can we have a conversation or could, could I send you more information? Think about what journalists are already writing about, and and if you're going to go down this route, then think about how can you frame your appeal in a way that is interesting to them. Um, and this last piece of arms, yes, putting out press releases is one thing, but also pitching an idea to a journalist to like make them make it more personal to them can be a really effective way of just broadening out uh, broadening out the ways in which uh, or the opportunity for for you to engage with press. Right, <laughs> I've gone through a lot. There's I can see. Um, can see that uh, there are quite a few questions. So, um, Beth, do you want to, or Karen, can you just talk us through these? Yeah, so there's five questions, which I'll start with. The first one is for media. Would you suggest the headline being that we're fundraising or pitch a different story with donate being the call to action once the story yeah. has been picked up? Exactly that. I would I wouldn't lead with with fundraising or appeal. I would lead with what because that is not the most interesting part of your of your appeal to a journalist. The journalist is more interested in what your appeal is about and what's unique there, what's interesting to them. So I would definitely lead and yeah, the call to action would I would absolutely then have as the as the um as the donate now. Cool. Great. Yeah. Um, the next one is, would you recommend as main points of focus for touch points as organizational capacity can be limited? Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I think I'd really think about prioritizing your warm audiences and where your warm audiences live and exist. 
So I would potentially not bother with press because um, unless you unless you're really sure from a local standpoint, you can you can get your message out there. I'd think about your social channels. I'd think about your mailing lists. I would think about supporters and ambassadors and how can you. And I, I can see there's another question about for parts of part time comms first. And I appreciate there's a lot in here. Um, and it's not to say that you need to do all of this, that you can still be have a really effective appeal by just prioritizing a few. I one think about where you where you, as I said where your warm audiences are living uh, are living are living and where they consume information, and the second is how can you mobilize a network of people to help you get the message out there. So if it's supporters, if it's trustees, um, if it's kind of your wider team as well, the more people that you can get doing your job for you to some extent, the more that the the more opportunity you've got to get more eyeballs on it. Great. And there's another question on how can we measure which of these touch points have been most effective for driving donations to our campaign page? Uh, so some will be easier. So like if you're running kind of paid digital, it's obviously you can, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to see kind of like get those metrics on click through rates and clicks on, on ads for mailing this as well. You should be able to see uh, open rates and click throughs and click throughs. Um, power and I don't, uh, sorry, Beth, I don't think that within the donation journey, there's the option, there's the, there's an option around kind of how you've heard about, how you heard about the appeal, right? Um, no, there isn't. So the only way um, is if charities, if their donor has like opted in to receive comms from the charity afterwards, could be yeah. a way to measure by contacting them directly, but yeah. Yeah. So, um, beyond, yeah, so beyond, uh beyond so so yeah so paid paid marketing main list are the, are the two best ways that you can use to to and then up beyond that it's qualitative so it might be the case it might be a case of when you do your thank you comms afterwards it's then it's, it's it's putting together a quick like a quick survey or type form to ask people kind of how they heard about it but yeah there, there is some of the stuff there some of those those um and some of those uh some of those touch points are going to be difficult to measure. If you're doing stuff in person, think about QR codes uh, and linking QR codes with with the page with the page I'll show you in a second at the end how to how to set that up. Um, and we might have to think about how you can use that. To, you can use that to track kind of more offline engagement as well. Thanks, Ned. Um, there's just a couple more. So one is how can Google Ads factor into our paid advertising? Um, really good shout. So yeah, for those of you who've already got your Google Ad Grant set up, um, which you should have a lot, and I think it's on, I, I need, I haven't looked as well, but I think it's about $10,000 a month. Um, Google Ads work really effectively if you know that people are searching for stuff that's similar to what you're working on. Um, so key search terms, key search queries, particularly kind of thinking about questions um, that people will be asking that you could might be able to sort of direct people to your uh to, to your appeal if you are working in a space where you don't think that people are regularly searching or it's very niche then google ads probably aren't going to be the most effective effective route for you I'd, I'd suggest more the paid paid digital marketing um route the other thing to think about and this is a bit of a kind of a convoluted or long-winded journey but within your if you're right if you've got a blog or a web page on your website that is talking about your appeal, really think about your content strategy. So thinking about the types of words, the types of terms that people might be searching for and how you can build that in, even thinking about the titles of your pages, the, the title of that article. Now, obviously that's going to direct people to your website, not to, not to big gives. So, um, so just think about what that journey is from that web page, from your web page on your site through to through to big give. And don't be afraid to have a couple of call to action buttons on that page. Don't wait for the end because it's because the re reader drop off rate you get on reading even like a 500 word blog is quite significant. So think about building one in a little bit earlier. Uh, and the last question is, would you suggest setting up a separate landing page on our website to the official Big Give page so we have more options in terms of digital advertising? Yeah, I think it's, it's we were better and I was discussing this on the one hand it's a bit of a trade-off so on the one hand you want you do want to keep that user journey to your landing page and ultimately to the date button as as smooth and as short as possible 
but as I mentioned earlier, having a blog that um, having a having a kind of an appeal page on your site that then takes people through to the to the to to the to the your landing page on Big Give can give you that extra additional kind of retargeting option, particularly if you've got the pixel set up on that on that page. Um, and also will give you an additional set of, met, of performance metrics to to think about. But um, but yeah, it's it's I'd recommend having it there. How much you use that to drive traffic to versus just have it there from an organic perspective, or if you've got donors who say who are going to be interested, want to hear more, um, is then thinking about how can you utilize that particularly with a content strategy to maximize your your SEO. Yeah, that was all the questions. Great, thank you. And thank you again, Ed, for a really great webinar. Lots of insightful content there. Um, and again, if anyone does have questions, feel free to message um, Big Give at hello at biggive.org. Um, and of course, this webinar has been recorded as well. So it will be available for you to review again if you would like to. But I guess that's no, nothing further else from us. So yeah, wishing you all a lovely afternoon and thank you. Thanks, everyone.